it's always lovely to sort of fall back into Cumbria work. Um, as some of you know, because you were there with me looking at you, Alistair, Kate and others, um, I worked for uh, many years uh, on, on a sort of consultancy basis for the Lake District National Park and helped to set up their Low Carbon Lake District Initiative, which in some ways was kind of the grandparent of Zero Carbon Cumbria. So it's great to dive back in. Um, Great, there we go. So I'm going to talk about democracy, so I'm going to start with a few votes. Um, vote number one, who uh, thinks, it's, it's just straight yes, no, um, I want you to raise your hand if you think that we will achieve uh, decarbonising Cumbria's transport system without local or central government. Can we do it without government? Put your hand up if you think we can. Put your hand up if you think we can't. Okay, that's pretty clear. Second point of that, um, if we are involving these governments, do we want them to be democratically elected or do we think we can get there without democracy? Democratically elected, hands up. Okay, can we get there without democracy? Hands up. Oh, you're a very democratic bunch because I've asked this question before and sometimes I get people saying, and to be honest, I have some sympathy for reasons I'll go on to talk about. Okay, I'm going to add a, I'm going to add a, a, a third question um, just to get our brain cells working. You, there's obviously a strong case for democracy in this room. Are the justifications, when you're thinking through why you answered yes to that, um, there's two sort of broad reasons. One could be ethical because you think it's the right thing to do. And the second could be instrumental because you achieve it because you believe it's the best way to achieve outcomes. Um, so I'm going to force a choice. I know you would say both if you're given the choice, which is why I'm not giving that to which is which do you think is more important, ethical considerations or instrumental? Hands up for ethical. Okay, I'd I'd say about 50-50. Uh, instrumental. Yeah, I think slightly more for instrumental actually. Brilliant. Uh, okay, I'll come back to that. Um, oh, so I've worked for, you know, 20 or more years on climate policy and I've basically been surrounded by scientists and very clever analysts who think hard and sort of technologically about the problem. That's brilliant. We need those people. Um, but I think that one element has been neglected and that is how you essentially not just what changes are needed but how you bring them about by what processes including the process of democracy do you actually um, make these you know jump out of the model or jump out of the, uh, the, 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 the spreadsheet or the drawing board and actually enact them in life and I think democracy has to be a crucial part of that um, process and actually uh, since we've got really serious or more serious than we were about climate action, I think that message is, is really coming home. So you've seen loads of calls for greater public engagement. One that I've been very closely associated with is the uh, Climate Change Committee, and I'll tell you about our work with them. They existed quite happily for more than a decade with a room full of very, very clever policy analysts. And then they realised, and we've been helping with them with this, helping them with this, that unless the policies that they uh, that, that, that they say are needed are actually, you know, accepted, uh, enthusiastically championed um, by uh, politicians and by extension by the people who vote for those politicians, they will, ex they will stay on the drawing board. And so the Climate Change Committee is one of a whole number of organisations who, who have sort of woken up to this. Um, I think it probably helps the case that we have, helps the case, silver lining, um, that we have this wider crisis of democracy. We've got our very own crisis of democracy in this country, haven't we? <laughs> very special characteristics. But, you know, obviously more widely across the world, we see uh, real problems with democratic systems and uh, especially amongst uh, younger people, um, real concerns about whether democracy is up to the huge task it has. So over the past few years, I've been involved in some brilliant sort of democratic experiments, not least Climate Assembly UK, which happened just before COVID, um, where um, at the, uh, uh, under the auspices of, of the UK Parliament, um, we brought together 108 uh, randomly selected citizens and said, right, how do we reach net zero? Over to you. We gave them a lot of help with expert, um, with expert input and guiding their discussions, and they came up with 
a sensible plan. This is them at work in, in Birmingham. Um, this was just at the stage where we were rushing out to see if we could find hand sanitizers to put on each table. <laughs> Um, so as well as Climate Assembly UK, we've seen this absolute mushrooming of local processes like citizens' juries, and that's built into the, uh, the uh, Zero Carbon Cumbria partnership, which is brilliant to see loads of processes at local level. So we've seen this sort of explosion, and, 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 and now I think it's time to take stock of that. Because involving people is a challenge. As I've already said, it's a challenge to policymakers who don't necessarily think or work this way. Um, but it's also a challenge to conventional understandings of democracy. And that's why my team at Lancaster, which has been going a couple of years now, has set out to really uh, think about how you embed democracy into the process of climate policy making. Not just one-off big bangs like Climate Assembly UK, fantastic though it was, um, but how you actually build it into everyday decisions about climate. Um, so we're doing that. Uh, we're doing that in partnership with the Climate Change Committee, with the Energy Systems Catapult, and with a whole range of of, of others that we um, that we uh, th th that we engage with. Um, but I'm going to um, tell you in a little bit of detail about what we've done with the Climate Change Committee because I think it's a good example. Um, a, 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 a sort of foundational piece of work that we did is actually to do, I love this, this is really geeky, but I love this stuff. We did an analysis of uh, the documents, things like the net zero strategy that national government um, uses to manage climate policy. And we looked at how they talked about people. And this pie chart on, the, on the, your left um, looks at how people are talked about in energy and climate governance. And this big, big, big blue pie slice is the word consumer. Compared with the budget here, and you see people are talked about in lots of different ways. They're talked about as students, uh, drivers, employers, officers, taxpayers, families, and sometimes consumers. But this just shows the difference how far behind we are actually in climate policy. The other thing is that if you add up all though, this, this pie should actually be half the size because if you add up all mentions of people in energy and climate governance, it's half the number of mentions they get in budget documentation. So there's a big gap here called people, um, except they're not called people, they're called consumer. And remember that consumers show what they want, not through voting, but through buying. So we don't like that. And we think that you should change that. And we actually set out to see how actually do conversations happen between publics on the one side, um, publics deliberately pluralized because there's no one monolithic public with one view. Um, different groups, local, national, different you know, people in different roles, young people, drivers, tenants, whatever that might be. Um, how do conversations happen between this lot and this lot, policy actors, by which we mean government, national and local, and so on. And we, we group these and you'll see that most of them are essentially one way. There's one way that policy actors talk to publics and that's through sort of campaigns and advice, you know, seat belts, drink driving, that sort of thing. It's happened a bit on climate, but not much. Um, then there's lots of ways in which uh, publics can tell policy actors what they think. They can sit in the road um, and wait till they're arrested. Um, they can uh, answer polls. Um, they can more formally answer consultations and so on. But all that is one way. So what we're really focusing on is how do you actually get a conversation going between these two groups? And the most fundamental form of conversation is actually the democratic process. It's elections because, uh, you know, we get to tell the politicians what to do. And if we don't like it, we kick them out. Right. It's it, it works kind of, um, but it's very blunt. It's basically once every five years put a cross in a box. And so what we are looking at and what we think there's huge promise in is this bottom blue arrow. Uh, which is a deliberative process. Now, how does that differ from the democratic process? Well, it's like, um, it's basically not seeing election, not seeing democracy as just about elections and putting crosses in boxes. It's about seeing uh, democracy as a continuing and two-way conversation between these two groups, um, partly through the wider system, which you know includes hard nuts to crack like the media, um, but also through the embedding of more formal uh, deliberative processes um, in the business of doing government. 
if you do this, and this is based on a, a, a review of a whole load of processes across different policy areas, um, these are all the benefits you get increasing, or, or rather, these are all the reasons that were cited for doing uh, d deliberation. Increasing trust, generating action by proving to policymakers that there is a, a way through this that citizens will, uh, will support. Um, making sure that representation works pro uh, properly. Really interesting one, I think, for an important one for transport, I think, is road testing policy arguments. So this idea that, and Alistair and I were having this conversation in the train, you need to be able to actually show people what the change could look like, um, you know, if infrastructure change, not just like what your decisions in the here and now, but if infrastructure changes, if taxation systems change, what's possible. And to a certain extent, you can use deliberative processes to road test that. You can show people what the future might look like and get their preferences. And that's very much at the heart of this project. You can also use it to see how policies fit together. Again, crucial for transport, because you can ask people, do you support this tax rise? They'll say no. Um, but if you say, you know, can we uh, raise taxes in this area, to reduce taxes in this area, to invest in that, to give these people a helping hand, people tend to say, yeah, I can, you know, I, I understand the rationale for that. So looking at how policies mix together is a really important part of deliberation. And new technologies, maybe that comes into transport, maybe not. So a quick example, and we did this jointly with the uh, Climate Change Committee, we've just finished. We ran a uh, citizens panel for them on home energy decarbonisation, specifically for homeowners. So if you are a homeowner at the moment, um, the, the implicit assumption is that you will install a heat pump if it's cost neutral with a boiler, and that you will just sort of spontaneously decide that you need that extra insulation and you will install it. Now, I'd be willing to guess that for a lot of people in the room, that assumption is actually correct. Um, but it is absolutely not correct across the wider population um, for all sorts of reasons. And that's why the Climate Change Committee asked us to work on this point, because it believed that the assumptions government's making on home energy decarbonisation are deeply flawed. Um, so we assembled a panel of 24 willing Brummies. They were selected to be representative of the homeowning population as a whole, um, dubbed able to pay, although that becomes increasingly uh, meaningless. Um, but that was the sector we were looking at, those who wouldn't get uh, sort of socialised support. And we actually co-designed policies. So we had the Climate Change Committee analysts in the room with the citizens, and we had them having conversations with each other. And so the, the, the citizens had a learning phase. What, you know, what on earth are they being asked to, 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 to talk about? Um, they talked amongst each other. And then you went into this co-design phase where we gave them all the information. And then we sat them down with blank sheets and said, right, write the policies for us. They did that. They came up with things like stamp duty rebates, even though they didn't know that that had been proposed by <laughs> many policy analysts for a decade. So it was really interesting that they got there spontaneously. Um, those proposals were then refined in conversation with climate change committee analysts who actually sort of kept pressing on will this get us to net will this get us to the reductions we need will this get will this get us um to which the citizens kind of said oh maybe not but also is that my problem which was a really interesting sort of exchange going on um and then we came up with a with a better package and this is the final thing. I'm not going to go through it all because we're talking about transport today, but um, parts of it look quite similar to what the energy policy community would suggest, like uh, really good um, education and information <laughs> and advice service would be helpful. Scotland's got one, we don't. Um, and, uh, you know, loans and grants, um, which, you know, have long been suggested. So actually, they came up with very similar suggestions um, and they endorsed a lot of the policy proposals in this area. But they also added their own stamp to it. And one of the main ones was this. You see this green sort of circle here is they thought of it. And th this, this one group came up and uh, came up with this and all the others were very supportive. They came up with this idea that it should be about the life cycle of being a homeowner. So you buy or sell your home you renovate it, you live in it. And they wanted to look at how you, um, how policies could um, influence at each stage of that, that life cycle. And, you know, I mean, it's not rocket science, is it? But it's very, very different to the way that this would have been designed if it was, you know, the policy analysts in Bayes or, in fact, the Climate Change Committee analysts that we were working with. It's a, you know, it's a different way of thinking about a policy, I think. 
Um, so that's just that's just one example. But um, the other and, and the other sort of just I'm I'm just sort of giving you snippets of some of the research I've done, um, uh, and and I wanted to say about how this happens at the local level because. A couple of my team are very, very embedded in the local level. A couple of them are actually local councillors. And, and, and we had a long discussion about how, what if you do something like this citizens panel that I just set out, right? What if you do that and you come up with the answers? Like, you know, that set of policy recommendations right now, just go and do it. Is that what happens? You know, the citizens panel, the citizens jury comes up with its solutions. What happens then? And um, we, we wrote uh, an article based on a conversation we had had um, about how people think this change might come about at the end of something like a citizen's jury compared to what actually happens. How people think it comes about is essentially, well, this is the story that's told. No one actually thinks it's true, but this is the story that's told. Climate change is identified by the scientists as a huge problem. Local authority declares a climate emergency. They announce at LCA's local climate assembly, they announce a local climate assembly, citizens do their stuff, produce recommendations, the local authority accepts them, the policies are enacted and the climate change crisis is solved, at least locally. That is the story we tell ourselves, right? And then we had a lot of fun dreaming up how it actually happens. <laughs> and this is it. So again, I'm not going to go through all this in, in, in detail, but this takes into account the often fractious climate politics. It takes into account the role of central government, which here is blank, um, because they're the ones that give local authorities their powers and responsibilities. Um, they might say yes or no to these things. Um, you know, there's a whole load of politics which um, determines whether or not you get to the announcement of a local climate assembly. But then also, once you've done it, and this is this, these brown things here, whether or not those policies or in what way those policies are adopted. So it's not saying that um, this isn't a bad model to have, but you're almost certainly setting yourself up for failure if you expect this. And no one really believes this, but it's a story that you have to tell um, in order, not just for local climate assemblies, for all sorts of things, in order to make a case for your way forward. We think it's actually better to sort of wallow a bit in this, in this messiness and work out how at each stage um, you can muster the, the, um, the, 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 muster the coalitions, muster the interest groups, dare I say fight against those interest groups who are opposing it in order to muddle through. And I think a politics of muddle, muddling through is really important to climate. Um, so uh, it, to a certain extent, this overpromising is inevitable, but I think being aware of the fact that it looks like this and actually sort of leaning into that is really important. I think another thing that our work is showing up really clearly is that climate isn't just a problem, is it? It's simultaneously the greatest problem we face, literally an existential threat, and also a series of very small problems like home energy decarbonisation, installing heat pumps, reducing meat consumption, designing, dare I say it, low traffic neighbourhoods. Um, they're all small problems, they're all kind of climate politics, but they all play out in different ways with different stakeholders. Um, and the big processes so far, like Climate Assembly, have tried to cover sort of the big problem and the small problem. And I think you need to do that, but you also need to be aware that you'll almost certainly not get answers to both in one process. So my very quick uh, reflections based on these experiments that I've been involved in. I mean, the first thing is just, you know, it works. And it's really important to stress this because a lot of policymakers are very suspicious about or very very nervous about the idea that, you know, normal people can come up with workable solutions to these problems, but they can. <laughs> and I've seen it now time and time again. It needs to be deliberative. You need that information and education component. Um, but the way that we, uh, the way that we explained it, stroke, sold it to the CCC was to say that it's about bringing different forms of experience and knowledge to the table. Of course, you need the engineers to say how the heat pump works. You need the planners to say, um, you know, what the what the local area could could look like. Um, but you also need people to say how they live their lives, what's important to them, what they'll vote for, and that is expertise. It's never called expertise, but it's that expertise that we absolutely need to tap into if we are going to do everything that's forecast in terms of uh, decarbonising um, 
transport, energy, food, diets, land use, you name it. There are some exceptions. I mean, industrial decarbonisation, probably less relevant, but for most things that we face ahead, we will need this type of expertise. Um, so to come straight back to this point about ethical or instrumental, I think the whole point is that in a democracy, you need both justifications. You, that there is a strong ethical justification, um, but also if you accept that you know, democracy is the way that we do things, then that is also instrumental because essentially you have to get politicians, to, you have to get people to vote for politicians to, uh, to do things that we need to do in order to decarbonise. That is an instrumental justification and to my mind an absolutely crucial one. Um, and, you know, the challenges of democracy and climate are intertwined and it's, it's, it's you know, in my, in my moments of despair, I think, oh, democracy's failing, oh, we're not tackling climate change. But actually, I think that uh, climate is one of the ways in which we can reinvigorate democracy. And certainly when you talk to the people who've been involved in things like Climate Assembly UK, like our Citizens Panel, um, their sort of sense of agency and involvement increases exponentially and they you know then quite a few of them then become sort of uh, really engaged in their own in their own right not just as consumers not just making green choices but also as citizens so i think there's something really powerful about the way we can reinvigorate democracy through these processes um yeah and i'll stop there <laughs>